I'm sorry, but we have already left. While I was in the bathroom at the rest stop, I got a call from Larry. I was curious about what he wanted at such a time. When I answered the call, I heard Larry and his in-laws laughing loudly. What's going on? I asked. He told me something shocking. We're going to have fun with the family. You can go back home and clean or something. I had been really looking forward to this trip because it had been a long time since our last one. Even though I had doubts about traveling with his family, I was excited to stay at a fancy inn. I can't believe he left me alone at a rest stop. Standing inside the bathroom stall, I felt deeply betrayed and shook with anger. Still, I managed to say okay quietly. It's unforgivable. Today was not only our wedding anniversary but also my birthday, and we came on this trip for that. I'll make him regret this. My name is Linda Harrison. I'm a 36-year-old housewife. I don't have any children and live with my husband, Larry. We got married exactly one year ago on my birthday. Larry is romantic and has always made a big deal of our anniversaries and birthdays. Growing up, he was treated to fancy dinners, trips abroad, and cruises for his birthdays. It seems those childhood memories have stayed with him because he loves celebrating special days in a big way. Now that we're married, Larry's family is wealthy. His father is the CEO of Harrison Securities. My mother-in-law has fully embraced the wealthy lifestyle, and Larry, as the heir to the company, sometimes acts a bit spoiled. But I married him because I knew he cherished me. We met at a matchmaking agency where men from wealthy families like Larry were popular. I almost gave up on finding someone there. When I met him, I was lucky because I seemed to be his type, which led to our marriage. It might have helped that I wasn't just looking for someone rich. I had always dreamed of getting married, and I was thrilled when it happened. But I didn't know that after getting married, my life would start to get tough. A year ago, Larry and I started our married life in a one-bedroom apartment in the city. Larry wanted a bigger house, but I didn't think it was necessary since it was just the two of us. I suggested we live within our means for now, and we could always move later. Even though we were in the city, our rent was expensive at $2,300. As a housewife, this made me feel guilty. Don't worry about it, my dad will handle it, Larry said. Although he was the heir and worked at Harrison Securities, I thought there should be some fairness with other employees. I wondered if it was really okay. But the next month, his salary went up by $800. Your dad's amazing to be able to increase your salary just like that, I said. It was time for a raise anyway. I won't let you face any hardships, Linda. Count on me, Larry replied. Even though Larry relied on his father's influence for money, I felt thankful for the raise and didn't argue. By the way, I'm having dinner with my parents tonight, he added suddenly. Is it like a business dinner? No, just a family dinner. I think I'll be back by 12. Take care. I was surprised. Even after marrying me, Larry casually mentioned having dinner with his parents on a regular evening. Caught off guard, I watched him say he should get going and then leave the house. Dinner on a weekday. Well, today is Friday after all. I hadn't heard about Larry planning to have dinner with his in-laws. Usually, as his wife, I'd be invited too. Not that I wanted a free meal, but it's important to build a good relationship with one's in-laws. I couldn't understand Larry's actions and started feeling unsure about our married life. After that dinner incident, Larry often went to his parents' house for reasons like, it's my cousin's birthday, or mom asked me to come over. As a first-time bride, I just agreed, thinking this was normal. But when I had dinner with a friend one day and Larry was absent, she was surprised. He goes home that often and leaves you alone for a cousin's birthday. That's crazy, she said. She had been married for six years and knew more about married life than I did. Realizing that her reaction was normal, I felt embarrassed. You're right, it's weird, but Larry says it's normal. Seriously, don't take this the wrong way, but hasn't he really grown up yet? She commented. Her words made me think. It's unusual for a 38-year-old, 
even one set to take over his dad's business, to prioritize family matters so much after getting married. I regretted not seeing Larry's true nature before marrying him. Returning home after dinner with my friend, I felt sad. I'm home, Linda. Where have you been? Isn't it normal for a wife to cook dinner and wait for her husband, Mrs. Harrison? To my surprise, my mother-in-law was in the living room. Larry was out, maybe at a convenience store. Why are you here? Weren't you and Larry supposed to dine out tonight? I asked. That got canceled because of some issue at the restaurant. I thought Larry had messaged you just a bit ago. Didn't you check? She pointed out. I checked my phone and indeed, 22 minutes ago, Larry had messaged that he'd be home early, but I had just gotten off the train. There was no way I could have gotten home and started dinner so quickly. Yes, he did message, but I only saw it just now. What the heck, this is the problem with kids from single-parent households. You can tell they weren't raised right, my mother-in-law said harshly. Her words hurt me deeply. Indeed, I was raised by a single mother after my mom gave birth to me and my father passed away due to an illness. Despite that, my mother raised me with a lot of love. I wished she wouldn't say things that put down my mother's hard work. It has nothing to do with being raised by a single parent. I just hadn't seen the message yet. I replied, clearly annoyed, but she ignored my comment and changed the subject. Well, anyway, I've always thought this, but your house is quite small. I think it's average. It's just right for the two of us. You can't be serious. I feel sorry for Larry living in such a cramped space. My interactions with my mother-in-law continued to stress me out. Both my mother-in-law and father-in-law, maybe because they are wealthy, often seem to look down on others. That's why I never got along with them. Realizing that further conversation was pointless, I silently started to make dinner. Ignoring me, she turned on the TV. From that day, she started coming over unexpectedly more often, and even my father-in-law came a few times. Mostly, they complained about how dirty the kitchen was or how small the house felt. Eventually, they would sarcastically suggest, you know we have a bigger house. Why not move in? I definitely didn't want that and declined every time. They always visited when Larry wasn't home, so he didn't hear their rude remarks. I once talked to him about it, but he replied, why not? Why is living together a bad idea? I was upset by his response. From then on, I realized there was no point in discussing it with Larry, and I just put up with it on my own. Soon we would be celebrating our first wedding anniversary, which was also my birthday. For your birthday this weekend, I'm thinking of celebrating bigger than last year. After all, it's also our anniversary, Larry said, coming home tipsy from work. Seeing his flushed face, I wasn't sure he meant it. Knowing he liked big celebrations, I felt a bit excited. Last year, you treated me to a delicious dinner, which was more than enough. That's nothing compared to what I've planned. Let's go on a family trip. A family trip? The term sounded odd just for the two of us. Noticing my confusion, Larry continued, my parents, cousins, uncle scenes, and all will join. We're heading to a luxury resort in Oceanside. All those people, and why Oceanside? Do you have a problem with a family trip, or is it Oceanside you're not keen on? No, it's not that, honestly. I couldn't understand why my birthday and our anniversary had to involve Larry's family, who weren't part of these occasions. I knew Larry was a bit out of touch, but I didn't expect such a strange idea. Although the choice of Oceanside confused me a little, it wasn't a big deal. Sounds fun, right, Linda? Sometimes you've got to let loose and have fun, Larry said, a bit drunk, as he grabbed my shoulders. I found myself agreeing with him. Over the next week, I couldn't stop thinking about the trip. At first, I was unsure about going with his whole family, but as Larry said, it was a rare vacation, and I decided to make the most of it. As I prepared for the trip, I started to feel excited, and I found myself genuinely smiling. I knew my in-laws would probably make their usual rude remarks, but I decided to ignore them completely. 
Finally, the awaited Saturday came, and Larry and I went to his parents' house, our meeting point for the trip. Well, Linda, you're late, aren't you? Do you even realize you're the star today? My mother-in-law said sharply in front of everyone. But knowing I was supposed to be the focus helped soften her words a little. I'm sorry, there was traffic, I replied. Excuses won't do. We should leave soon. Otherwise, we'll be late to our luxury resort. All right, all right, let's get going, I said. Despite their complaints about us being late, it was bearable. After all, they had been making such comments all year. Larry's cousin, who looked much younger than him and had a mean look in his eyes, made me wonder if everyone in the family was mean-spirited. My worry seemed justified when he made a demeaning remark, this is Larry's wife, not what I expected. I looked away from him, figuring that reacting would only encourage them to criticize me more. I decided to act maturely. I'm so excited. I've been to luxury resorts many times, but tonight's place costs $2,000 per person, I heard someone say. Hearing the price of $22,000 shocked me, and a sudden thought crossed my mind. I got into my in-law's car, and as soon as my father-in-law started the car, we began moving. The drive to our destination in Oceanside would take about three hours. About an hour into our journey, we decided to take a short break at the next rest stop. I'll be right back, heading to the restroom, I said. All right, off you go, my mother-in-law waved dismissively, almost like shooing away a stray dog. I walked to the rest stop bathroom, feeling as if everyone's eyes were on me, or maybe it was just my imagination. Inside the bathroom stall, I took a deep breath, relieved that the trip had been uneventful so far. I hoped the rest of our journey would be just as smooth. Just as I was settling into that thought, my phone vibrated in my pocket. It was Larry calling. Expecting him to ask me to pick something up, I answered casually, I'm still in the restroom, Larry. With what sounded like amusement, he replied, accompanied by the laughter of my mother-in-law, sorry, but we've already left. There was a moment of stunned silence on my end while laughter echoed from their side. What do you mean? I asked. Larry replied, we're going to have fun with our family. You should just go home and clean, Linda dear. Today's trip is just for the Harrison family. It's a pity, but you'll have to stay behind. Goodbye. I was stunned. I had been looking forward to this trip for a long time. Having his family join us was a bit concerning, but I was excited about staying at a luxury hotel. And now, they had left me alone at the rest area. I was shaking inside the restroom stall, feeling completely betrayed. Trying to keep my anger in check, I simply replied with a quiet, okay. This was unforgivable. Today was both our wedding anniversary and my birthday, and they had brought me on this trip. I was determined to make them regret this. After leaving the restroom, I called someone. The person on the other end was shocked and shared some surprising news. Really? I asked. Yes, they answered. Then they promised to come and pick me up. Being left alone at the rest area like this was unbearable. I prayed for a quick rescue. An hour later, my uncle scene arrived in his car to pick me up. I'm so sorry to trouble you like this, I said. It's okay, it's quite an unfortunate situation, he replied. Yes, they're headed to a luxury hotel in Oceanside, I mentioned. My uncle seen thought for a moment, then seemed to realize something. I think that's the case, I replied. I'm really sorry, but can you please take me there? I'll take the train back. Got it, the drive there is nice anyway, my uncle seen agreed happily. About an hour later, we arrived in Oceanside. Larry and the others had come here before us. In front of us was a luxurious inn with a grand gate, a well-known high-end hotel, the only luxury accommodation I knew of that costs $2,000 a night. At the reception, I was told, dinner starts at 6 o'clock p.m., please follow me. The person who greeted me with a smile was my mother. Linda, it's been a while, she said. Dressed in an elegant outfit and smiling gracefully in a way that might seem formal to others, it was unmistakably my mother. 
This inn has been run by my mother's family for many years, and she currently holds the position of the innkeeper. After becoming a single mother, she began working at this inn. So to me, this place feels like home. I had called my mother from the rest area and was surprised to learn that there was a reservation today from Harrison Securities. I suspected they were going to a luxury hotel in Oceanside, but I never imagined they would be coming to the inn my mother runs. Of course, the family doesn't know that my mother manages this inn. What a terrible story, Linda. You can't just let this slide, my mom said. Yeah, I know. That's why I came here, I replied. Let's get you changed over here, she suggested, as I prepared to greet them at the dinner table. An hour later, at 7 o'clock p.m., my in-law family gathered for dinner. I stayed in the next room to remain unnoticed, slightly opening the door to observe inside. The spa was amazing. I'd want to come here every day if I could. If it were closer, we could indeed come every day, one of them said. At the very least, if you become the CEO, we could afford to come here anytime, another added. Really, I'm looking forward to that. I mean, the subordinates handle all the work anyway. I want to become a CEO soon too, Larry added, thinking they were just among themselves, making some rather crude remarks. But when my mother appeared from the other side of the door and greeted them, the room went silent. Today, I will be in charge of serving you. Please let me know if you need anything, my mom said, bowing with perfect grace. There was a tangible tension among the family. However, when the food was served, they resumed their inappropriate discussions. Both my mother and I did nothing, simply watching as the plates emptied before them. It's great that we all could come. We got rid of the bothersome daughter-in-law, and the food is delicious. Perfect, one remarked. If you say that, she might get angry, you know, another cautioned. It's fine, she's not really one of us. To be honest, she never was. After all, it would be a shame to have a child from a single-parent family in our household, my mother-in-law said harshly. Hearing her mother-in-law's harsh words, my frustration boiled to an almost uncontrollable point. At that very moment, my mother entered the room with a dessert plate loaded with cake and fruit. Today, I've heard it's Miss Linda's birthday and also her wedding anniversary with her husband. When my mother asked where to place the cake for Miss Linda, the family looked at each other, confused. Nobody told you that, they mumbled. Excuse me, I'm the innkeeper, and I've clearly heard about it. Did Larry call? I didn't tell anyone, Larry muttered. There was an awkward silence, and the in-laws exchanged nervous glances. Finally, the mother-in-law raised her hand. I am Linda, she said embarrassed. I was too embarrassed to mention it at my age, but thank you all for the surprise. Given that the only woman in the room was the mother-in-law, her reaction seemed appropriate. However, my mother just gave a faint smile, seeing her act. Hey, what's so funny? Is it strange to be surprised at my age? The mother-in-law asked. No, not at all. I wasn't thinking that, my mother replied. Then just bring the cake already, the mother-in-law demanded. Yes, but before that, there's something I'd like to share, my mother said calmly. I took a deep breath. Linda Harrison is my daughter. Everyone in the room looked shocked and raised their voices in surprise. Seeing an opportunity, I quickly opened the door from the adjacent room and stood next to my mother. Welcome, this innkeeper is my mother. It's a pleasure to meet you, I said. Larry exclaimed, Linda, why are you here? And what do you mean she's your mother? It means exactly that. This inn belongs to my family, and I also intend to take over this place someday, I explained. In truth, Larry had never met my mother before. Part of it was because my mother was busy with the inn, and Larry and his parents also insisted on not meeting her face to face. Larry had called me for our wedding introduction, but he never met her in person. I showed my mother a picture of Larry and explained who he was. It was an unconventional introduction, but I believed my mother had accepted him. From your earlier conversations, could you please refrain from mocking and belittling my mother for being a single parent? I asked. 
We just stated the facts, they replied. What's with the sudden drama? What grudge do you have against us? They continued. Neither Larry nor his mother nor anyone else seemed to realize the extent of the disrespect they had shown me. I was exasperated. I let out all the anger I had been holding back. If I have any grudges, it starts with you, Larry. I thought you were a good person when we got married, but it turns out you're too attached to your mom. You married me, so you should put me first, right? Don't team up with your parents to make fun of me. Larry was speechless, unable to argue against my points. My mother listened quietly to my outburst. Turning to my in-laws, I asked, Why do you treat me this way? If I'm such a nuisance, I can leave the Harrison family right now. You'll become a lonely, poor single woman, yeah? Are you sure about being alone? Both the mother-in-law and Larry sneered. Looking between my mother and me, I stared back firmly. It's okay, actually. I'm pregnant so I won't be lonely, and if I inherit this in, I won't have any financial worries. The truth was, I found out I was pregnant last week and hadn't told Larry yet. Only my mother knew, which is why she wasn't surprised. A child? What are you talking about? I haven't heard about this, Larry said, confused. Wait, Linda, if that's the case, it changes things. You should have told us sooner. Upon learning I was pregnant, the family immediately changed their attitude. I couldn't stand their unreliable and unreasonable behavior any longer and shouted again, no, my decision is final. Let's proceed with the divorce through lawyers. I will live happily with my child and my mother. Saying this, I opened the door to the hall they were in and left. The door slammed shut loudly. I'm done with this. My child will be happier without that family. Whether they tried to change my mind or not, I received over 45 calls a day from Larry and his parents. Eventually, I blocked all their numbers. A few days later, I received a letter from Larry informing me of our official divorce. The letter expressed his regret and pleaded for me to return, but I ignored it and tore it up. I thought he might neglect our child just like he prioritized his parents over me, and I absolutely didn't want that. Being alone and lonely will be your fate, not mine, I thought. He should enjoy his bachelor life. Currently, I am nurturing my child in my womb and discussing future plans with my mother. Once the child is born and grows a bit, I plan to send them to daycare and join the inn's business. The path to becoming the next innkeeper is long, but I'm determined to work hard to raise my child properly. On that important day, I stood in front of my father's grave. My father had been the CEO of a major company, and after his death, my brother-in-law Kyle took over. He inherited the company and a huge fortune. In contrast, all I got was an old mini-truck. Kyle, flaunting his good fortune, mockingly said, With this, I've got the company and the entire estate in my grasp. That mini-truck suits you. But to me, that mini-truck was more than just a vehicle. I looked at it fondly, and when I started the engine, I noticed a destination already set on the navigation system. What's this? I wondered. With a firm yet gentle grip, I began to drive. My name is Jack Nicholson. I am a 44-year-old tutor. Now, I am standing before a large coffin where my father rests peacefully. My relationship with my father had always been very complicated. He built a construction company from scratch but I chose a different path. I left home to become a teacher right after university, fulfilling a childhood dream. This decision led to many heated arguments, and for a long time, we barely spoke. But despite our disagreements, I never hated my father. I had my own dreams to follow, and I couldn't give them up to run the family business. Even though I felt a strong duty as the eldest son, Guilt weighed on me for not meeting my father's expectations. This guilt kept me from visiting my parents' home. My mother relied on my sister, Lauren, to update my father about my life. Lauren and her husband would often send expensive gifts or arrange trips for my father's birthday or their anniversary, pretending they were from me. Each time, Lauren would encourage me, saying, I wish you and Dad could talk directly. He's just trying to be strong. 
Deep down, he must be feeling lonely. I often thought about Lauren's words and would just shake my head. But one day, I got the sad news that my father had cancer. When I heard this, I quickly quit my job and went back to where my family lived. I realized that what really mattered was life itself, and the past arguments with my father seemed so small. I decided to move back to my hometown, teach at a local school, and take care of my sick father. At first, my father was shocked to see me return, but he eventually accepted it quietly. I didn't say much either. I just stayed by his side and took care of him, helping him whenever he needed it. He would thank me softly, and those words brought me some peace. Sadly, my father's fight with his illness ended. The last chapter of his life closed quietly with me, Lauren, and our mother by his side. We couldn't know what he was thinking in his last moments, but we hoped his soul was at peace. Even though we expected it, losing him deeply affected us all. My mother, Lauren, and even my young nephew, Peter, were all very sad and cried. The only one who didn't show any emotion was my brother-in-law, Kyle. During the funeral preparations, he coldly asked, did he finally die, huh? Hearing that, I was proud of myself for staying calm and not reacting angrily to Kyle. Instead, I focused on planning my father's funeral. This kept me busy and helped distract me from the pain. I ignored Kyle's harsh words and made sure everything for the funeral was done right. Kyle and I had never gotten along well, and our relationship only got worse over time. But despite everything, I kept my focus during this tough time. I first met Kyle when he was a skilled worker at my father's company, and I really respected his skills. It felt like I had gained a real brother when Kyle married my sister, Lauren. He was five years older than me and seemed like a role model. Before they got married, I often asked him for advice on various problems and he always listened with understanding. One of our big discussions was about whether I should join the family business. Kyle would say, Sean should live his own life, and Jack, you have your own path. No one knows which choices in life are the best, so the most important thing is to make choices you won't regret later. Encouraged by his words, I switched from business school, where I was studying management, to the faculty of education, where I really wanted to study. As time went on, Kyle and Lauren got married and started their life together. Twenty-two years have passed since then, and the distance between my father and me grew wider. I moved on with my life, missing the chance to close that gap. But when I heard about my father's illness, I dropped everything and rushed home. Kyle, who once greeted me warmly, had changed. He now seemed uncomfortable around me. When we were alone, Kyle would say coldly, You came back in a hurry when you heard Sean was sick, didn't you? But no matter what, you won't inherit anything. His words caught me off guard, and I struggled to respond. What do you mean? Don't act like you don't know. It might be a coincidence, but even if you now want to run the company, it's already decided that I will be the next leader? His harsh words shocked me, and I replied louder than I intended. No, that's not it. I didn't come back for the company. I realized I hadn't been a good son and wanted to apologize to Dad, even if it's late. Kyle dismissed me. I don't need your fancy talk. It sounds like something from a TV drama. Lauren likes that kind of stuff, but were all those gifts you sent just a way to look good in front of scene? That's absolutely not true. I tried to explain, but Kyle had already made up his mind and wasn't interested in believing me. His words also seemed like a slight against Lauren, and for the first time, I felt a deep divide between us. Ever since that incident, I started to feel really upset with Kyle. He began to mock me openly, no matter how much you try to win scene over, that time has passed. Don't make me laugh. Go back to where you belong and take care of your troubled students, he would say. At first, I thought deeply about how I appeared to others and how they saw me. But Kyle's words showed he was more concerned about himself than our father. His behavior often seemed disrespectful to both his father-in-law and his wife, Lauren. I started to believe that Kyle had married Lauren mainly to get closer to my father's company and wealth. 
He rarely visited my father when he was sick and didn't help take care of him. Now, all I could do was work as hard as possible to protect the company my father, seen, had built. Kyle always sounded polished, but he really just wanted to avoid problems. On weekends, he would go play golf, claiming it was for business. He hardly ever took care of his own son. He said he wanted his son to learn many skills to eventually take over the business, but he left all the driving and housework to Lauren. When Lauren showed a bit of unhappiness about this, Kyle would passionately take her hand and say, I'm giving my all for seeing's sake. Now is the time to produce results by any means necessary. Let's overcome this trial together. Lauren found it hard to stand up to him and usually just nodded, even though she seemed reluctant. Kyle was good at acting like the perfect husband in front of Lauren, so it's no surprise she believed him. He showed his true self to me, probably because he thought I was like him. I eventually got used to Kyle's mocking, and it didn't bother me as much. However, when our beloved father passed away, I was heartbroken. I felt a deep sadness and emptiness. Although Kyle seemed upset about our father's worsening health, I couldn't shake the feeling that he had been waiting for this moment. This thought made me very sad and angry. After our father died, Kyle inherited most of our father's large fortune. Even though he was just a son-in-law, he had the same rights to the inheritance as Laura and me, according to my father's will. He got most of the shares of the company and a lot of wealth. This unexpected turn of events left me speechless, even though I was my father's biological child. I had thought the inheritance would be split fairly among the three of us, but instead, Kyle got almost everything. All I received was an old mini truck that my father once loved. In public, Kyle seemed surprised, but alone with me, he laughed and said, You came all the way from the city to this small town, took care of seed day and night, and all you got is this little truck, huh? What an ironic end. Now the company is mine, and you're left with just this mini truck as your inheritance. It's like a comedy. As he left the room with a smirk, I felt empty inside. Holding the mini truck keys tightly, the cold metal made me face the harsh reality. But my family tried to cheer me up. Keep your head up. Scene had his reasons. He didn't mean to upset you. That truck was something Dad always loved. It was his favorite vehicle. He surely cared about you. Despite their kind words, I was too hurt to respond. I knew that what you inherit doesn't measure a father's love, but the fact that Kyle, who seemed to be waiting for my father to die, got almost everything, was deeply insulting. It wasn't about the money, it was the pain of seeing my father's hard work go to such a man. I felt powerless to change the situation. Clutching the truck key, I decided to take care of the mini truck, the only thing my father left me. It seemed to hold a deeper meaning. I hoped that cleaning the truck might help me sort out my feelings. I carefully washed the truck with a hose and then sat in the driver's seat, where my father used to sit. Starting the engine, I noticed something unusual on the navigation system. It was displaying a single thick blue route instead of just showing my location. That's odd. Why is there a destination set on the navigation system? I wondered. This usually only happens when a specific route is being followed. When I checked the destination on the screen, it showed only coordinates, not a specific place. It would take about an hour's drive. Wanting to go for a drive in the mini truck, I didn't think too much about it, put the truck in first gear, and left the house. An hour later, during a pleasant drive, I arrived at what seemed like a home. It was a surprise. In front of me was a small, modest house, quite different from the larger homes in my hometown. It felt warm and inviting. The area was quiet, and I couldn't see or hear anyone else around. I got out of the truck and stood in front of the house, feeling a bit confused. There were no signs to indicate what this place was but it seemed the navigation system had brought me here for a reason. With some hesitation, I rang the doorbell. As the door slowly opened, the person I saw was the last one I expected my mom. I've been waiting, Jack. Come in, dear, she said. Why are you here, mom? 
And how come this place was set in Dad's navigation system? I asked. I will explain everything, but first, come inside and relax, she replied. Following her inside, I found the interior simple yet cozy, with just the essentials. My mom made some tea and started to explain in a calm voice. Actually, this was your father's secret hideout. A hideout? I was surprised. I've never heard about dad having a place like this. She explained, this place is our secret spot. We came here when we needed our own space or when we wanted some peace and quiet. If we ever had a small argument, our rule was to come here to cool off. You didn't know about it, did you? I was stunned and deep in thought. I had no idea such a family rule existed. She continued, And this, this is something your father wanted you to have. Saying this, she handed me a brown envelope. It was slightly bulging, as if something important was packed inside. I decided to read the letter addressed to me. Jack, I have caused you a lot of trouble and made you endure unbearable hardships over the years. I am truly sorry from the bottom of my heart. The letter was filled with my father's reflections on his past mistakes and his deep gratitude towards me. He wrote, Your mother often tells me that it was your choice to leave home, and a son has the right to choose his own path in life. We are both stubborn, but when you came back after I fell ill, it was a wonderful surprise for me, although I couldn't express it well, because I'm not good at showing my feelings. I am deeply grateful to you for supporting and taking care of the family. This was the first time I heard such heartfelt words from my father, and it made me very emotional. The letter also mentioned Kyle. To tell the truth, my distress towards Kyle grew over time. He's good with words and makes people feel comfortable, but I could see it as true nature. I suspected his sneaky behavior around the house was his way of trying to claim ownership. I was too tired from work and taking care of you all to notice his cunning actions. But now, knowing Kyle as I do, I believe these suspicions were correct. The letter continued, I have no intention of giving the company to you, but if something unexpected happens, I have left a significant amount of money with your mother. This is to ensure that you and Lauren will not be in need. Please accept it. After finishing the letter, I looked up at my mother, she said nothing but looked at the brown envelope. I hesitantly reached for it and checked its contents, confirming everything was in my mother's name. She began to speak firmly, if I transfer the accounts to you and Lauren's names, it would be considered a gift under tax laws. If it's mentioned in the will, Kyle might try to take it. Your father gave this money to me secretly while he was still alive to avoid Kyle's interference. Now, I want to give it to you and Lauren as a living gift. She explained this to me, but I was still trying to understand the full impact. The amount written in the account book she showed me was huge, unlike anything I could have imagined. I had never seen so much money before. It meant a lot to me that my dad had left this for me, not because of the amount, but because it showed he really cared about me, not just Kyle who was seen as his successor. This touched me deeply. We didn't often share deep emotional words, but I knew he always cared deeply for us. I want everything I entrusted to your mother to be passed on to you as a thank you for all the gifts you've given me, and for that, I am truly grateful, he wrote. Before I knew it, tears were streaming down my face. I couldn't hold back my emotions. For a long time, I felt that my father never really understood me, but I was completely wrong. He always understood and valued me. That's probably why he trusted me with that old mini truck, knowing I would value it and use it well. Mom, I really wish I could have done more for Dad, I said, feeling deep regret. But my mother comforted me with a gentle smile. She seemed to understand the regret I felt, saying, it's natural to think you could have done more when mourning a parent. But you brought your father great joy and gave him so much love. You were his greatest pride. Hearing her words made me cry again. They also inspired me to make a firm decision. I wouldn't let the company my father built fall into the hands of someone like Kyle, who had wished for his death. I decided to quietly resist and make a careful plan without letting Kyle know 
I had acquired a significant fortune. The first step was to contact the corporate executives my father had trusted to build a foundation for their support. They agreed to help, supporting my desire to carry on my father's legacy. Their reactions made it clear that my father had never spoken poorly of me. Meanwhile, my mother and sister acted soothingly during the will reading, keeping Kyle's attention off me. They continued to act the same way in front of Kyle, which made him think he had succeeded and looked down on me with arrogance. Hey, hey, do you, abandoned by your father and left a poor man, still intend to stay in this house, he taunted. I'm the new president now, and make your defeat and go back home. Kyle would say these words dismissively, waving his hand as if he was shooing away a small fly. Since becoming CEO, Kyle's arrogant attitude created a tense atmosphere in the company. Despite his high position, he ignored his duties and became rude to his staff. This caused a lot of problems and many skilled employees left unhappy with his leadership. Kyle didn't question his approach and remained overly confident. Those who can't grasp my superior vision might as well quit immediately, he would say in public, making decisions without listening to anyone else. As problems in the company increased, Kyle enjoyed spending money and living lavishly, while his passion for the business seemed to disappear. When I first met him, he seemed like a great person. He was skilled and even my dad liked him. How had he changed so much? She cried every night, hiding her tears from the children. I couldn't just watch the company fall apart. I was quietly planning my next move. The day came when I acted. I left home early and waited at the office for Kyle. When he walked into the president's office, he was shocked to see me sitting there. What the hell are you doing? Why are you sitting there? Get this person out of here, he demanded. The one who should be leaving is you, I replied calmly. What are you talking about? Have you lost your mind? Kyle looked at me as if I was an annoying insect. Using the assets our father left us, I had bought the majority of the company's shares. An extraordinary general meeting of shareholders was held, and you were officially removed as president. Kyle, I'm sorry to say, but you are no longer the president of this company. Wait just a minute, he stammered, confused and repeating words that made no sense. Don't you understand? I now control two-thirds of this company's shares. You thought the inheritance was just an old mini-truck, but that truck turned into money in an unexpected way. Kyle tried to dig into details about the hideaway, but I avoided his questions and changed the subject, which only made him more upset. The game is over, leave this place immediately, I told him calmly and handed him several documents. As Kyle looked through them, his face went white. What is this? He asked. These are the minutes from the extraordinary general meeting of shareholders, and this other document is your dismissal notice, I explained. Kyle became very angry, crumpled the papers in his hands, and shouted, You think this will hold up? I'll take legal action. Go ahead with legal action. We have good reasons for our actions. I responded calmly. What reasons? You've just been after the old man's wealth and this company from the start. It's nothing but jealousy, Kyle accused. Let me ask you directly, Kyle. Have you been using company assets for personal use and signing leasing contracts for your own benefit? I asked. What if I have? What's it to you? Kyle replied, his face turning pale with shock. How did you know about that? He stammered as I listed his misconduct, like taking home computers and other appliances meant for company use. There's more. Computers and TVs that should be at the office are at your house, being used for personal things. Isn't that enough reason to act? I pressed on. Struggling to respond, Kyle frantically tried to defend himself. Why? How do you know about that? He asked, his lips trembling. I kept my gaze fixed on him and continued, you should have been more aware of your responsibilities. Did you become complacent when you thought you controlled everything? I had been gathering information about Kyle's actions from the company's executives. After our father passed away, Kyle became more arrogant. He used to at least pretend to respect others, 
but as president, he began to shift his work onto others and even fell asleep in his office. This attitude caused many loyal employees who respected my father to leave, frustrated by his behavior. Kyle, upset by the situation, doubted my ability to manage, emphasizing that it was impossible for me to fulfill the role of a manager. I had never worked a day in this company. Think about it, how can someone with no experience in running a company become president? It's impossible to trust management to someone like you, Kyle argued. You're absolutely right, I agreed. I have no intention of becoming the president of this company. My sitting in this chair is just a symbolic message to you. In fact, a new president has already been elected by a different board of directors and is already carrying out their duties. Kyle was stunned. He stood there with his mouth open and his eyes wide, shocked by the turn of events. He'd have been sure that I was after the presidency and had schemed to replace him. As I've said many times, I'm not after the president's position. My only goal is to honor my father and protect the company he spent his life building, I explained. Who would believe such fancy talk? Kyle retorted. He thought I only cared about the wealth and status that came from our father, not his true worth. After my reply, Kyle trembled with anger for a moment, but then composed himself. Do you think this is over and you can just enjoy it? He scoffed and then stormed out of the president's office. That night, something unexpected happened. Lauren threw divorce papers at Kyle, ending their marriage. This was a result of his misconduct at the company and his eventual firing. The new president was chosen from among the directors who respected my father and were determined to protect what he built. I felt the company should be led by someone who would continue my father's legacy, a sentiment my mother and sister supported. As I coordinated Kyle's dismissal with the lawyers, Lauren was preparing for the divorce. On the day she mentioned divorce, her hurt voice filled the house with a heavy atmosphere. Why do you turn away from me now? Is it because I've lost the title of president and you've lost interest in me? Kyle asked. Maintaining her calm but firm, Lauren replied, there's no point in talking about betrayal. You were the one who betrayed our relationship from the start. Your love was not for me but for the title of the president's daughter. You neglected our home, didn't help raise our children, showed no respect to our sick father, and in the end, you tried to take everything from our father for yourself. Now it's time for you to face the consequences. Kyle had no response to Lauren's words. She had endured a lot, worrying about her children's futures and the fate of the company. But thankfully, the inheritance from our father gave her a solid financial base to raise her children after the divorce. We plan to live a peaceful life away from conflict with our mother and sister. Our only concern was the possibility of retaliation from Kyle, but he was now out of funds. He had lost a lot of money to an investment scam and was even in debt. This scam involved a man pretending to be from a brokerage firm who was actually a fraudster. Kyle, swayed by convincing words, lost a significant amount. This situation shows how people can exploit those who suddenly have a lot of money. Now, Kyle was suffering the financial consequences of his actions. Meanwhile, I spent fulfilling days taking care of my mother. I enjoyed a peaceful, comfortable life, continuing my work at the tutoring school. My mother and I also took great joy in caring for my nephew Peter, who was very fond of us. His presence added happiness to our daily lives. When I grow up, I'm going to be a president like Grandpa, Peter declared, his words filled with the innocence of childhood dreams. This brought smiles to our faces and even made my mother tear up with emotion. Lauren and I exchanged knowing looks, our smiles reflecting warmth and understanding. You might say that now, but I wouldn't be surprised if you want to become a teacher when you're in college. I teased him gently, reflecting on similar past statements, which made everyone laugh. But I'm not very good at studying, so maybe I won't make a good teacher, he said seriously, furrowing his brow. His earnestness made this even more endearing and prompted more laughter, this time filled with affection. In that moment, 
filled with an overwhelming sense of happiness, we realized we were truly living in the present, enjoying our family unity and ready to face whatever the future might bring. I don't need such an expensive child, Simon said cruelly to his son, who was trying his best to stay strong despite his illness. Rachel, standing next to Simon, burst out laughing. Seeing their terrible behavior, I decided to cut ties with them for good. If you too feel that way, I, as his grandmother, will adopt him, I declared. Feel free to do so, Rachel said carelessly. It's not like he has much time left anyway. Just don't come back to us asking for money when it's time for his funeral, okay? She laughed loudly after saying this. Hearing these heartless words made me furious. From now on, we're strangers. Never contact me again, got it? Goodbye, I said firmly. I had been told something important about my grandson Maxime's condition by the doctor, but I chose to cut ties without telling my son and his wife. When they find out, I'm sure they will deeply regret their actions. As I gently hugged my grandson Maxime, I felt certain they would regret what they had done. My name is Camille. I'm 63 years old and a housewife. My husband passed away seven years ago, and now I live alone. It was lonely at first, but I've gotten used to it. With my husband's inheritance, my retirement fund, and my pension, I can live a comfortable and peaceful life. I have a son named Simon. He's 33 and still hasn't settled down. Even though he's at the ideal age for marriage, he doesn't have a steady job and lives a carefree life. After graduating from college, he got a job, but quit after three months because he didn't get along with his boss. He has had jobs on and off, but none of them lasted. My husband and I sometimes had to pay off Simon's debts. When my husband was alive, he often lectured Simon about his lifestyle. After my husband passed away, Simon rarely visited. In my husband's will, Simon only received a small inheritance, which might be why he was upset. I haven't kept in touch with him since. I supported Simon mentally and financially until he graduated from college. But I feel responsible for the fact that he has grown up to be so careless. I thought I had done enough for Simon until he became an adult and started his own life. I believed I didn't need to help him much after that. However, one day, out of nowhere, Simon came back home without any warning. It had been two years since we last saw each other, and he looked different, tired, and worn out. His style had changed too. He was wearing an aloha shirt, which stood out in our small town surrounded by farmlands. Hey, I got married, he said. I was caught off guard by his news, and I was left in a state of shock and confusion. Seeing my surprised face, Simon clicked his tongue and called out to someone in his car. Hey, it's okay now, come over here. I'm coming, a woman replied in a high-pitched voice. She stepped out of the car, dressed in a way that was hard to ignore and looked out of place. To my surprise, a small child toddled along behind her. A child? What is going on? I thought. Look, the kid is too young for us to work properly and we're always short of money. That's why we've come back home, Simon explained casually, as if it was no big deal. I couldn't believe how nonchalant Simon was about this surprising news. The little child, who seemed to be around three years old, had long hair, making it hard to tell if it was a boy or a girl. But on closer look, the child resembled Simon when he was young. From today on, we'll be staying here, Simon announced. Hello, I'm Rachel. Nice to meet you, the woman said breezily, passing by me and entering the house as if she had always lived there. The little child tried hard to follow her, but she paid no attention and quickly went inside. Seeing this, I couldn't bring myself to turn them away, so I let them stay. As soon as they placed their luggage down, it seemed like they were about to go out. I quickly stopped them and asked for an explanation. After my husband passed away, Simon quickly met Rachel, and they started dating. Soon after, they found out she was pregnant. By the time they discovered the pregnancy, it was too late for an abortion, so they decided to have the baby. But things turned out to be more expensive than they expected, 
and they ran out of money, which led them back here. However, it seemed they still had money for their own pleasures, just not for their child. What? How can you be so irresponsible? I exclaimed. Cola, irresponsible? If you want the kid, he's a hassle. He can't even talk yet and, to be honest, just gets in the way, Simon replied. Hearing such heartless words from my own son was shocking, but what shocked me even more was seeing Rachel nod in agreement. Well, that's how it is. Looking after and loving your grandchild is a grandma's job, right? Please help us out. We're going to grab a drink near the station. Maxine, be good and stay with grandma, Simon said. Despite my attempts to stop them, they quickly left, ignoring everything I had to say. The station is about a 15-minute drive from our house, definitely not walking distance. Considering it's a rural area, I wasn't even sure if taxes were available, and even if they were, would Simon and Rachel use one to come back? Hey Maxime, I called out tentatively to my grandson. He responded with a bright, adorable smile, a smile that reminded me so much of young Simon. Seeing his smile made me smile back, though it felt like my heart was being squeezed. Such a precious smile, I knew I had to protect him from now on. Seeing Maxine's innocent smile, I made a vow in my heart to do so. During our time living together, Maxine picked up household rules quickly. He was a very bright child. By the time he turned three, he could speak very well, even better than most children his age. I couldn't help but adore him. As for my eldest son and his wife, they consistently ignored Maxime, treating him like a nuisance. They had no intention of working and contributed nothing to the household expenses. They would go out drinking every day and sometimes wouldn't return for several days. This bizarre situation had become normal for Maxime, and it seemed like he cautiously observed their moves to avoid getting close to them. I couldn't stand it any longer and spoke to Rachel. Rachel, could you spend a little more time with Maxine? After all, you are his mother. What? Why are you saying this? I'm busy, you know. You're the one taking care of him, right? She said without even looking at me, busy with her manicure. Claiming to be busy when she spent her days doing whatever she pleased was quite the statement. Suppressing the urge to yell at her, I thought of Maxime and pleaded once more. Maxime just turned three. Children that age cling to their mothers when they feel lonely. Oh please, I never wanted to be a mother in the first place. Maybe it's better if he calls you mom, isn't it? Are you serious? I asked, stunned. Oh come on, of course, she said dismissively. I'm not, you look so scary right now, Rachel said. She must have seen the anger on my face. In the end, Rachel and I couldn't have a proper conversation about Maxine and she just left with Simon to go drinking as usual. Maxime didn't seem to mind that his parents left. He continued flipping through his picture book. When he found his favorite fish, he excitedly pointed it out to me and tried to tell me about it with his limited words. Seeing him happy was a relief, but I couldn't stop worrying about how Simon and Rachel planned to take care of him in the future. My worries only grew when I thought about Maxime's future. With my husband's inheritance, I could cover his school fees if needed. I had no choice but to be ready for anything. As I prayed at my husband's altar, I whispered to myself. Glancing at his photo, I felt as if he was encouraging me, and I nodded in response. For two years, after deciding to take care of Maxime, I endured living with Simon and Rachel. I watched their reckless behavior. They went out every day, often taking money from my wallet without asking. During this time, I took care of Maxime, and he barely spoke to his parents. Maxime grew up quickly, and just before he was to start elementary school, a tragedy struck. Hello, are you Maxime's grandmother? Maxime has been taken to the hospital. Can you come immediately? On my way back from picking up adoption paperwork from the city office, I got a call that Maxime was in the hospital. It took two years of living together, multiple trips to the city office, and finally, the chance to adopt Maxime was within reach. 
I thought I could finally separate him from Simon and Rachel, but something terrible had happened. Holding back my emotions, I rushed to the hospital where Maxime had been taken. When I arrived and asked for details, the doctor said Maxime would need to be admitted. Confused, I asked, Doctor, what's wrong with Maxime? What's the problem? I'll explain everything once his parents arrive, the doctor replied, waiting for Simon and Rachel. The nurse approached with a worried look, which made me uneasy. She nodded at me and whispered something to the doctor. What? The parents don't want to know about their own child's condition. The doctor's loud voice echoed through the hospital, shocked by Simon and Rachel's indifference. I sighed, realizing it was just as I expected. Swallowing my pride, I knew I had to step up for Maxine. I explained our family situation to the doctor. At first, she seemed doubtful, but after seeing the detailed records I kept and realizing that Maxine's biological parents weren't coming, she believed me and explained Maxine's condition. Ma'am, about Maxine's condition, please stay calm. The test results show cancer in his kidneys. What? Cancer? This can't be, I said in shock, falling from the chair I was sitting on. The pain from the fall was nothing compared to the shock of hearing that my five-year-old grandson had cancer. The nurse helped me get up, and the doctor continued speaking. Fortunately, there's no sign that the cancer has spread. With immediate surgery, we can save his life. Really? If he undergoes the surgery, he will be saved? I asked. Yes, however, we need the parents' consent for the operation. The cancer could progress quickly, so ideally we'd like to operate as soon as possible after explaining this to the parents. Hearing this, I felt lost. I couldn't imagine Simon and Rachel showing any concern for Maxine. As I thought about what to do, I decided to visit Maxime's room first. There, I saw something I couldn't have imagined. Hey, I heard you have cancer. The doctor was talking to your grandma in another room. Your lives in danger, and if you keep trying to live, it'll cost us more money. So do us a favor, Simon said, his voice full of disdain. Hearing these heartless words made my rage build inside me. But Maxime, looking at his parents, had a somewhat cold and mature look in his eyes that seemed far beyond his five years. His parents seemed taken aback, but soon started laughing again. Really, you're such an expensive kid, Simon said mockingly. What are you saying? You two are the ones wasting money. I burst into the room, unable to hold back any longer. Simon looked surprised, but quickly turned to Maxime and continued mocking him. We don't need such an expensive child like you, he said cruelly to his own son, who was bravely facing his illness. Beside Simon, Rachel was laughing hysterically. Seeing their outrageous behavior, I decided to cut ties with them forever. If that's how you feel, I, as his grandmother, will adopt him. Go ahead, Rachel said dismissively. He won't live long anyway. Just don't ask us for money for the funeral, she laughed loudly. Hearing this, an indescribable rage surged within me. From now on, we are strangers. Don't ever contact me again, got it? Goodbye? The doctor told me about my grandson Maxine's health condition, but I didn't share it with my eldest son and his wife. Instead, I decided to cut ties with them. When they find out the truth, I'm sure they will regret their choices. As I gently hugged Maxine, I had a strong feeling that they would regret what they had done. I told Maxime about his cancer and the upcoming surgery. I reassured him not to worry about the cost and asked him to go through with the operation. Maxime, I want you to live. I know the surgery might be scary, but you will recover. I'll be right here with you. Grandma, if you're with me, I'm not afraid of anything. I'll go through the surgery and treatment, I promise, Maxime replied. Seeing Maxine trying to smile and not to worry me, even after hearing such harsh words from his own parents, I hugged him tightly. I also told him about the adoption process I had been preparing. Maxime seemed a bit worried at first, but eventually accepted it. That night, I discussed the adoption with my eldest son and his wife, who were drinking at home. 
They always said they didn't want a child because of the costs and didn't really care about Maxime. To make them leave my house, I offered them a significant amount of money to stay away from us forever. Without any hesitation, they signed the adoption papers and showed no signs of regret or attachment to Maxime. They looked happy about getting the money and quickly left the house. During the talk, they didn't even glance at or speak a word to Maxime, who was sick. Their lack of responsibility as parents saddened me, but I was relieved that one source of pain for Maxime was now gone. Soon after, Maxime had the surgery, which thankfully was successful. Being young, he recovered quickly and was soon ready to be discharged. Doctor, thank you so much, I said. Congratulations on your discharge, the doctor replied. I'm glad. If you ever feel something's wrong, come see me right away. Yes, understood, Maxime responded. During his stay at the hospital, Maxime grew close to the doctor and hugged him in gratitude. Once back home, Maxime lay down on his bed and said, Grandma, thank you so much for letting me have the surgery. Oh, don't mention it. I'm your parent now, and it's what parents should do. You must be tired today. Get some good rest. Okay, I'll take a short nap, Maxine said, quickly falling into a deep sleep and snoring lightly. Not long after, I received a call from the hospital. Oh no, did I leave something at the hospital? I thought, answering the phone quickly. Hello, sorry for the sudden call. Actually, someone from a TV station came to the hospital, and they really want to meet Maxine. A person from a TV station? Why Maxine? I was completely puzzled, and my mind was filled with questions. After listening carefully, I found out that during Maxine's stay at the hospital, he became friends with a writer who was there for an interview. The writer had shared some of Maxine's stories online, and they were well received by the public. This led to discussions about turning them into a movie. I was utterly surprised. I hadn't known about this since Maxime had talked to the writer outside of my visiting hours. They told me that if it becomes a movie, Maxine wouldn't act in it, and they wouldn't use his real name. But since it's his story, people who know him might recognize it's about him. I see, let me think about it. I'd like to discuss it with Maxine too, I said, wanting to think calmly. I decided to hang up the phone for now. Maxine woke up, rubbing his sleepy eyes. When I told him about the call from the hospital, his eyes sparkled with joy. Really? My story is going to be a movie that everyone watches. It seems so. They said they'll hide your real name and make the movie, I explained. Huh? Why? It's fine, let them use my name, Maxime replied. But if they use your real name, everyone will know about your illness and our family situation. I said, surprised by his reaction. Facing my surprise, Maxime answered with an innocent smile because I want to tell everyone I have such a wonderful grandma like you. Oh, Maxime, thank you, I said, tears welling up in my eyes because of his kindness. I never expected to hear such heartwarming words from him. That night's dinner tasted saltier than usual, but I felt deeply happy and fulfilled. The movie preparations went smoothly. While the film didn't use Maxime's real name, he was introduced as the inspiration for the story. The movie became a huge hit after its release, with theaters packed every day. I watched it myself, and even though I already knew the story, it was still a moving experience. I couldn't hold back my tears watching the touching scenes of a loving grandmother and her smart grandson trying to survive together. Later, Maxine was invited to many events to talk about his story on days when he didn't have school. He led a busy life, wanting to support other kids his age who were fighting cancer. Having gone through it himself, he wanted to cheer them on. I did my best to support him. Thanks to the many lectures he gave, Maxine's bank account grew enough for a lifetime. With this money, he could focus on his treatment without worrying about finances if his illness came back. Even if something happened to me, there would be more than enough money for him to attend university without any concerns. Thinking about the future, I carefully stored his bank passbook, knowing it would be essential. One day, after living this way for a while, 
My eldest son and his wife, whom we hadn't heard from in about three years, suddenly showed up at our house. It seemed they had lost a lot of money through gambling and were now in serious debt. As soon as they saw Maxime, they approached him with the same sleazy smiles they always used. Oh, Maxime, you've grown so much. It's been a while since we last saw you. Don't you miss your mom and dad? Exactly, we took care of you when you were a baby. Don't you think you owe us? Rachel added. Despite abandoning Maxime, as soon as they found out about his illness, my eldest son and his wife were still as selfish as ever. Facing them, Maxime gave them a cold look and said, Who are you? At his unexpected words, both Simon and Rachel were taken aback, their mouths tightening. Trying not to laugh at their reactions, I stepped between them and Maxime to continue the conversation. Excuse me, but who might you be? Do you have some business with my son, Maxime? I asked. What are you talking about? Maxime is my son. That makes him your grandson, Simon said angrily. But I looked at them with a cold stare. Under my gaze, Simon flinched for a moment, but then he turned to Maxine with a pleading tone. Listen, Maxime, I messed up. I lost more money than I thought in horse racing. I'm in a really bad situation now. Can you help me out? If I had $30,000, it would be enough. Please. $30,000? That much? I exclaimed, shocked by the unexpected amount. No matter the reason, a debt of $30,000 from gambling was unthinkable. My late husband and I always warned Simon about gambling and going into debt, but it seemed like he didn't listen at all. The money Maxime saved came from the fees he received for giving lectures. He went through a lot to earn that money, sharing his painful memories in front of many people. I told Simon and Rachel, you two can't use his hard-earned money just for your enjoyment. Then I firmly closed the front door in Simon's face. Outside, my eldest son and his wife started shouting and complaining, making such a loud noise that I had to call the police. Soon after, the noise stopped, and it seemed like they had given up and gone home. However, they didn't give up that easily. The next morning, they started causing a scene in front of our house again. Mom, please listen. I've changed. I'm turning over a new leaf. I'm sorry for everything. Please let me in, Simon pleaded. Maxime, I'm so sorry. From now on, I'll be with you and take care of you properly. So please let me in, Rachel added. They kept knocking on the front door early in the morning annoying the whole neighborhood. Despite their constant noise, Maxine calmly continued his breakfast inside. Eventually, he went to the entrance, but I didn't hear the door unlock. Curious, I quietly checked what was happening. Instead of opening the door, Maxine was watching them from a small window near the entrance. They kept knocking, unaware of his gaze. Maxine then made a proposal. All right, I'll give you a few questions. If you answer even one correctly, we can live together. Really? Just like that? Despite everything, you're still a kid at heart, aren't you? What's the question? I'll answer anything, Simon replied, sounding relieved and cheerful. After a brief pause, Maxime asked the first question. First question, tell me my favorite and least favorite foods. Um, hey Rachel, you should know this, right? Simon stammered clearly clueless. Rachel, trying to help, thought for a moment and answered confidently, any mother would know that. Your favorites are pudding and chiffon cake, and you hate bell peppers, don't you? Hearing their answer, it was clear they didn't know Maxime at all. I sighed quietly without them noticing, feeling a mix of sadness and frustration. Maxine looked down at the couple from the window and asked, are you sure that's your final answer? Of course, it's unthinkable for a mother not to know her own son's likes and dislikes, Rachel said confidently from outside. She seemed certain about her answer. Hearing this, Maxine laughed heartily. The couple, not expecting to be laughed at, were probably flustered. After a good laugh, Maxime, now calm, replied to Rachel, That's wrong. What a shame. What? Why? You always looked so happy when there were cakes, didn't you? Rachel insisted. That was dad's favorite, not mine. 
I used to have an egg allergy, so I don't eat things like pudding or cakes with eggs. I love the egg-free cakes grandma makes, and I hate whipped cream, but I absolutely love bell peppers. Is that true? Rachel asked, shocked. Before coming to my house, Maxine was only given cheap instant porridges and slices of bread. I often wondered how he managed to stay healthy with such a poor diet. The reason Maxim didn't get sick was largely because of the meals he got at daycare. The principal noticed his diet was lacking and provided allergy-friendly meals, carefully monitoring his health. When she warned Rachel about her poor parenting and threatened to report her to child services, Rachel decided to stop sending Maxine to daycare and moved in with me. Hey, hey, how long do you think we've been apart? How would I know what you like now? Rachel said, frustrated. Then, next question, what is my birthday? Maxime asked. Your birthday? Rachel and Simon looked confused. Maxime's birthday was actually today. Normally, a parent wouldn't forget their child's birthday, especially a mother. But despite this simple question, the couple showed no sign of knowing the answer. Why aren't you answering? It's such an easy question, isn't it? Maxime asked. Uh, of course I know that, right, Simon? Rachel said, turning to Simon. Yes, of course, I know that. Simon replied in a panicked voice, but it was clear they didn't know the answer. If you don't know, you should just admit it, Maxine said. Even after waiting for about 10 minutes, they still didn't answer. Maxine muttered under his breath, and his sad expression showed that he was hurt his own parents didn't remember his birthday. My heart ached for him. No, wait, I just had a brain fart. Of course, I know your birthday. Rachel tried to cover up her mistake. I know it, I know it, Rachel said. You just caught me off guard. It slipped my mind. Can you give me a hint? She asked, trying to cover up. In response to their silly excuses, Maxine laughed out loud, but I could see tears forming in his eyes. Feeling bad for Maxime, I quietly moved closer and held his hand. He was surprised to see me, but he nodded, wiped away his tears, and looked straight at his parents. Hey, real parents remember their child's birthday without needing hints. I've never been celebrated by you two, so I expected this, Maxime said. What? After all, I did to give birth to you, and this is how you repay me. You should be grateful. Rachel snapped back, starting to get angry. Maxine gave her a cold look, and she went quiet. Well, here's the last question. It's an easy one, Maxine said. I was diagnosed with cancer and treated at a hospital. Which organ was affected? This was a question any parent should easily answer, especially since Maxine's illness had been on TV for several days. But their responses were unexpected. Wasn't it the heart? Simon asked. No, it was the stomach, right? Rachel added. I was so shocked I leaned back and looked up at the ceiling. Despite Maxime's story being a hot topic, my son and his wife showed they had no interest in him at all. Hearing this, Maxime must have thought, I never expected it to be this bad. I felt sorry for him, but to my surprise, he started laughing. Thanks, I get it now, it's worse than I thought, Maxime said. What? Did we miss something? Rachel asked, puzzled by Maxine's reaction. Maxine smiled, but his eyes were not smiling. It was kidney cancer. You claim to be my family, but you know nothing about me. The only one I consider my family is Grandma Camille. Shouldn't you be grateful I gave birth to you? Rachel asked, still angry. That's the point. To me, the only one I can call a parent is Grandma Camille, Maxine said. Oh, looks like my ride is here. Please don't bother coming here again. Maxine left them with those words and closed the window with a bang. Outside, my son and his wife were shouting in anger, but when the police arrived and warned them, they immediately stopped and everything went quiet. I was worried that Maxine might have been hurt by this, but he looked relieved and smiled at me. What I said to them just now, that they are not my parents, is truly how I feel. I've always wanted to call you mom, but I was too shy to say it. Can I call you that? Of course, Maxime. Thank you, I replied, 
deeply touched by his words. I hugged Maxin tightly, tears in my eyes. Mom, you're squeezing too hard, he said, but he hugged me back just as tightly. As for those two, they claimed they had lost their son to me, and were saying nonsense like I was being deceived by him. But everything they did to Maxime is documented and recorded, including testimonies from his kindergarten and the parenting diary I kept. The police reviewed the evidence and dismissed their claims. Still, the police contacted us to verify the facts. The officers seemed frustrated with the stubborn claims of my eldest son and his wife. After the call from the police, Maxine went to the police station alone to see them. When he came back, he looked refreshed. I said my final goodbyes to them and told the police everything about the terrible things they've done. They won't have a normal life for a while, I guess, Maxine said. He showed me the evidence he had mentioned. Shockingly, there was footage of the couple committing theft and exchanging money with a stranger. It seemed they believed they could live comfortably off the royalties if they could get Maxime on their side. They even planned to sell him to someone involved in shady dealings in the black market. Seeing their terrible plan, I was in shock and felt chills down my spine. I never thought my own son could be so cruel to his own child. Maxime spoke softly to me, seeing I was dumbfounded. I asked the manager to look into it, and we found out this shocking truth. I thought if you found out, you might be so shocked that you'd faint. That's why I kept it a secret. I'm sorry. It's okay, Maxime. I'd do anything for you and always have your back. It's even scarier to not know about such terrible things. I'm really sorry for hiding it from you all this time. The only one who worries about me this much is you, Mom. That's why I want to protect you too from now on, Maxime said with a slightly embarrassed look. Seeing Maxime's shy expression, tears of joy welled up in my eyes. Even though he has faced many hardships and seems mature for a nine-year-old, that shy expression made him look just like a child, which warmed my heart. My heart warmed as I thought about my eldest son and his wife. They were later found guilty of many other crimes and ended up serving nearly nine years in prison. They never showed any remorse or apologized. The letters they sent, collected by Maxime's manager, still demand repayment for bringing him into the world. Maxime continues to visit hospitals to encourage sick children. He's now in middle school and has hit puberty, but his kind and honest nature remains the same. He's living a good life. Lately, it seems he has a girlfriend. I see him sneaking out for dates and can't help but think how cute he is. The cancer we worried about shows no signs of coming back, and his recovery is going well. Although it's impossible to say it will never return, regular checkups are essential. For now, he's living just like any other kid his age and seems happy every day. I still fuss over Maxime and nag him a lot. Naturally, there are times when he gets annoyed, but taking care of him gives my life meaning. I hope Maxime can bear with me a little longer. My biggest goal now is to live long enough to see Maxime's wedding as a parent. If I'm being greedy, I'd love to see the face of Maxime's child, my great-grandchild. To make sure I stay healthy until then, I've started going to the gym. Because of this, people around me are often surprised and call me a lively and young grandmother. For Maxine's sake, I'll strive to be a mother he can proudly show off for as long as possible. I'm going to keep pushing forward. That's the punishment for stealing my dad from me, Kelly said in the middle of our argument. She grabbed my arm and forcefully dragged me outside. Then she shoved me into a dirty, scary basement. I tried my best to resist but younger people are just stronger. I was trapped inside the scary basement. In the dark and chilly basement, I started to feel ill. What should I do? How can I get out of here? Though I was panicking, I felt a slight weight in the back pocket of my jeans. Oh yeah, I have this. I quickly searched my pocket. My name is Olivia Anderson, and I'm 45 years old. I work as an administrative assistant at a company. The job isn't too complicated, but it's never boring. 
I find it fulfilling, and I love my coworkers because they are all kind-hearted. It might be rare, but I genuinely enjoy my job every day and don't find it burdensome. However, there was one thing that concerned me, I wasn't married. Seeing my friends get married and live happily ever after made me feel both envious and a bit sad. The thought of living the rest of my life alone was quite daunting. There were no prospects in sight, and I constantly wondered if any man would ever take an interest in me. Every day, I was consumed by thoughts of the future, filled with unease. A few years after I started having these thoughts, I finally got married. His name is James Anderson. He's nine years older than me and works at one of our client companies. James had recently become the point of contact for the company I worked at, so he visited often. At first, we were both hesitant, but gradually we grew closer and started dating. After a few years, James and I were able to tie the knot. I was truly happy. I hoped with all my heart that we would build a happy home together. James has a 17-year-old daughter named Kelly from his previous marriage. He had been upfront about Kelly while we were dating, and I had met her several times. Kelly is very reserved and seems particularly fond of James. She was always by his side, glued to him. Seeing Kelly like that warmed my heart. I hoped that as we started living together, Kelly and I would become close. However, I didn't fully understand Kelly's true nature. After marrying James, I moved into the home he shared with Kelly. I quit my job to become a homemaker, doing everything I could to ensure that James and Kelly had a comfortable life. I prepared well-balanced meals and kept the house tidy. It might seem ordinary, but I believed it would make their lives more pleasant. Having a family was so different from living alone, every little household chore became a lot more challenging. What comforted me during those times was a cat named Oliver. Oliver had always been at James's house. He was a bit chubby, and I heard he liked to sneak out, but I believed that as long as I was always at home, he wouldn't run away. Even though I faced many exhausting days, I always felt soothed admiring Oliver. Life after marriage had its challenges, but I felt much happier than when I was single. However, something weighed on my mind. I worried that Kelly might not think highly of me, leading her to ignore me. Even when I tried to start a conversation, Kelly would look at me with a confused expression and continue to ignore me. Kelly, welcome home, I would say, but Kelly would only give me a fleeting glance and not respond. How was school today? Did you have fun? I asked, hoping to connect, but Kelly would remain silent, making me feel more isolated. I tried to keep the conversation going, but she still wouldn't say a word. After petting Oliver for a bit, she went straight to her room. Even though she kept ignoring me, I believed she just hadn't accepted me yet. She was at that challenging age of 17. If her father remarried and suddenly there's a new woman in the house who isn't her real mother, it's understandable that she would be wary. I had met Kelly a few times before James and I got married, but she just couldn't seem to warm up to me. I was racking my brain trying to figure out how to get Kelly to accept me, but despite my efforts, Kelly never warmed up to me. Ignoring me became her norm. She began openly avoiding me, and whenever she was around me, she had a constant look of displeasure on her face. When James was home, she'd talk a bit, probably to avoid upsetting him, as she adored him so much. Still, I thought it was better than not talking at all. It's been about five years since I married James. The distance between Kelly and me never seemed to close, and life felt kind of empty. Even after living together for four years, I didn't know what Kelly's favorite food was or what her hobbies were. The only thing I knew was that she adored Oliver. I had grown used to Kelly's gaze, which initially felt intimidating. When Kelly reached high school, she surprisingly started a conversation with me. Hey. Huh? What's up? I was taken aback that Kelly spoke to me, and my voice unintentionally went up a notch. Was she finally opening up to me? What's she going to say? Various emotions bubbled up, 
but I silently waited for Kelly's words. However, what Kelly said was completely unexpected. How long are you going to stay in this house? What? I'm asking how long you're planning to stay. Can you leave soon? You're in the way. Why would you say that? Being told out of the blue to leave was a shock. I was puzzled as to why she'd suddenly say that. Questions swirled in my head, but finding the words was challenging. Then Kelly explained her feelings, shedding light on her past actions. Look, I love my dad. It was just the two of us, you know. Why did we suddenly have to live with an old woman like you acting all motherly? I just can't handle it. What? I thought if I treated you like you weren't there, you'd break and divorce him. Was school fun? Seriously gross. I was bombarded with her hurtful words, leaving me speechless. In front of dad, you act all high and mighty, but it's been hard for me, you know. Maybe it's time you realized your worth, old lady. Seeing my sad face, Kelly seemed satisfied and flashed a smile. I had never seen Kelly look like that before as she walked away. All along, she had harbored such negative feelings towards me. Her hurtful words and the suggestion to reflect on my worth kept echoing in my head. Before I knew it, tears streamed down my face. What was the point of all the effort these past five years? I tried so hard to gain Kelly's approval, but in the end, she never accepted me. How should I approach Kelly now? I tried desperately to find an answer, but none came. From that day on, Kelly began hurling insults at me. Olivia, I've always thought this, but you're really bad at cooking. It's seriously awful. Oh really? I'm sorry. It's sad for Dad, you know. There are so many better people than you out there. With Dad's charm, he could remarry in a heartbeat. Kelly would say things like this, but she would put on a facade in front of Jane's. You know, Olivia's cooking is really delicious, right Kelly? Yeah, it's yummy, Kelly would reply. It wasn't new, but seeing Kelly's quick switch always left me dumbfounded. What's wrong, Olivia? James would ask. Olivia is just so happy. I feel happy yet not happy such a complicated emotion that probably no one can understand. I guess so, I replied, trying to maintain my composure. But Kelly lost all restraint and kept on with her tirades. Many times, I thought about breaking down and confiding in James, but I never could take that step. James always seemed so busy with his daily work. I just couldn't bring myself to burden him with my problems. I thought if I just endured, everything would be okay. Even if Kelly said she loved James, she might eventually move out and live alone. I saw it as just enduring until then. Six years later, Kelly went on to college after graduating high school and later got a job at a company near home. Around the same time Kelly started working, James began taking on business trips. Initially, they were just for a day or two, but gradually the duration increased. It wasn't rare for him to be gone for two weeks or even an entire month. A few months after these trips began, Kelly's verbal abuse didn't stop. With James gone, it seemed Kelly had no filter. The food's terrible. Can't you do something about it? Say something, Kelly demanded as she left her unfinished meal and quickly went to Oliver's place. I looked at the leftover food and gently put down my knife and fork. I had endured so much up to this point, but one day I finally reached my breaking point. Endless verbal abuse and a cold attitude every day. I was treated more like a maid than a mother. There wasn't any particular trigger. While Kelly was hurling insults at me as usual, I finally snapped. Just get out already, you're so annoying. Hey you're always telling me I'm a bother and to leave. Enough is enough, I shouted back. Kelly, not used to me talking back, was taken aback, but quickly responded with harsh words. What? Why are you suddenly talking back? I seriously can't deal with this. I can't take it anymore. If you can't stand it, why don't you move out? You have a job, you have money, and you do fine on your own. I'm a homemaker. I can't just up and leave. Maybe I hit a nerve because she didn't respond. I could tell she was fuming. Lost your tongue? 
What happened to all that energy just a moment ago? I said. Just as I was about to get the upper hand, Kelly suddenly grabbed my arm, squeezing painfully tight. Ouch, I protested, but Kelly wasn't listening. She forcefully dragged me outside. Hey, I yelled as she pulled me toward a small storage theory basement. Without hesitation, she pushed me into it. Though I resisted, I was no match for her younger strength. In an instant, I was locked inside the scary basement. What are you doing? Hey, let me out. I desperately banged on the wall, pleading with Kelly to release me, but she didn't seem to care. I can't just let you out, even though you say so. Oh, by the way, I haven't told you, but I've got a trip planned for four days. Well, try to survive in that cramped theory basement. Four days? Are you serious? Hey, what about Oliver? Oliver has an automatic feeder, so he'll be fine, she said. I was stunned by her completely irresponsible comment. You're being so irresponsible. Shut up. Never come out of there again, she yelled back. That's the punishment for stealing my dad from me. Soon after, Kelly's presence disappeared. Inside the dark, cold, scary basement, I started feeling sick. What am I going to do? I can't bear to stay in here for four whole days. I started panicking even more, desperately banging on the walls, but it was no use. At that moment, I suddenly felt the weight in my pants pocket. Oh yeah, I have it. I quickly reached into my pocket and pulled out my smartphone. Such a lucky break. I called my nearby friend, Linda Blair. Oh hey Linda. Olivia, what's up? It's rare for you to call. I explained my situation and asked Linda to come help. In just a few minutes, Linda arrived. Are you okay? She asked as she opened the door, letting in the bright sunlight. Even though I'd only been in the scary basement for a few hours, it felt like days since I'd been outside. I thanked Linda and she took me to her house. I didn't have my keys and James was away on a business trip. Given all that, Linda told me I could stay at her place for as long as I needed. When I got out of the scary basement, I felt that Kelly was gone. She probably already left for her trip. The next thing I needed to do was contact James. I sent him a message, telling him what happened and where I was. I couldn't exactly ask him to come back, but deep down, I hoped he would. While chatting with Linda, I received a call from James. Hello, Olivia. Are you okay? He asked. James, I'm fine. Thanks. Listen, I'm heading home now. I'll come pick you up. So wait at your friend's place a bit longer, okay? Oh, what about your work? Forget work. Just know I'm on my way. I think it'll take about five hours, so hang tight. James seemed worried and was making the effort to come back. I thanked James and hung up. He said he's coming to pick me up. Can I stay here for another five hours or so? I asked Linda. Of course. Honestly, you have such a caring husband. I can kind of see why Kelly might be a bit jealous. Jealous? Yes, jealous. She was like, I love dad, right? From what I've heard, she's probably jealous that you married her beloved dad. Is that so? Now that it was mentioned, it did seem like jealousy. Just because she's family doesn't mean you should hold back. Telling her off when needed is for Kelly's own good, you know. Okay, Linda's right, I thought. No matter how long we've lived together, acting impulsively in anger, like I did, isn't going to help Kelly. But how can I get through to her? I racked my brain for a solution and came up with a somewhat forceful plan. I immediately shared the plan with Linda. That's a pretty cool idea. Give it a shot, she said. I'll give it my best shot. Linda seemed amused and supported the idea. Two hours later, James arrived at Linda's house and knocked on the door. Are you okay, Olivia? I'm fine, thank you, but you were at work. You matter more to me than any job, he said. James had decided to take a few days off from work. Is it okay for you to take time off like that? Yeah, they said they'll manage. I feel like I need to have a serious talk with Kelly. After that, I explained to James in detail what Kelly had done to me and how I ended up trapped in the storage basement. James listened intently and apologized. 
I'm sorry for not noticing. It's not just your fault. I didn't speak up, and Kelly was doing all this secretly. Still, I should have noticed something was off. I'm truly sorry. A heavy atmosphere lingered until Linda broke through it. Hey, why the long face? You're going to scold Kelly, right? Buck up. Linda's words somehow inspired me. You're right. Afterward, we thanked Linda and went home. I felt like I might have troubled James, but if this could make Kelly's behavior settle down, I'd be glad. When we got home and things calmed down a bit, I told James about my plan for Kelly and why I felt the need to go to such lengths. After pondering for a moment, James said, well, honestly, considering Kelly's past, it might take something drastic to get through to her. Two days later, it was the day Kelly would return. Since we didn't know when she'd be back, we left the window closest to the basement open, keeping an eye out for her return. Around 5 o'clock p.m., a taxi stopped in front of our house, and Kelly stepped out with her luggage. The plan I put into action involved making the basement, where I was supposedly locked up, seem ransacked and emit a rotting smell. Frankly, it's debatable if a human being would pass away in such conditions for four days. Moreover, even if the person did pass away, the stench of decay wouldn't arise immediately. However, I bet that Kelly wouldn't know such details. With a slight intention to shock her, I executed my plan and secretly watched Kelly. I noticed Kelly stopped in front of the scary basement. From her reaction, it seemed my plan was working. Oh, what's that smell? Kelly frowned at the stench coming from the scary basement. She suddenly looked alarmed and forcefully opened the door to the scary basement. Kelly was choking from the intense odor, but her expression quickly changed to shock as she saw the inside. What's this? It's been ransacked. We approached the stunned Kelly and spoke up. How was your trip? Olivia, why? Wait, Dad's here too? Kelly, we need to talk, James said with the scariest expression I'd ever seen on his face. Seeing James's face, Kelly seemed to understand everything. She sat on the sofa, looking downcast. You've done some terrible things to Olivia, James said. Kelly remained silent. You panicked earlier, thinking that maybe Olivia had died in there. That's not it. Then why did you look so panicked in front of the scary basement? After a pause, Kelly revealed something unexpected. I thought Oliver was inside. What, Oliver? After all, Oliver used to escape often before. I thought maybe he somehow got inside the scary basement and couldn't get out. You should have been worried about Olivia after locking her up. What would have happened if I hadn't come back? I forgot about Olivia. I couldn't believe she forgot she locked me up. I was so shocked I couldn't find the words, but James was livid. I never thought you'd be like this. I'm truly disappointed. But wait, I Kelly tried to justify herself, but James cut her off. Wait for what? Going to make excuses? It's just that I felt like Olivia took Dad away from me. You did something that could have had serious consequences just because you felt like it, and then you forgot about it. I never thought I raised you to be like this. With that, James sighed. He seemed to have completely given up on Kelly. Sensing this, Kelly stood up and started defending herself again. Dad, don't say things like that. I just love you so much. If Olivia had just waited quietly for four days, I would have let her out. If Olivia hadn't called her friend, none of this would have happened. Dad didn't have to leave work early or take the day off. This is all your fault. Wouldn't it have been better if you hadn't obviously disliked me? Maybe if you hadn't locked me up, your misdeeds wouldn't have been discovered. You act on your own, but shove all the responsibility onto me. What? Oh, by the way, it seems you were worried about Oliver. But didn't you once say that leaving Oliver alone for about four days was okay? That's just unthinkable. Do you realize you have a living creature under your care? I thought it would be fine. If you truly cared, leaving Oliver alone for four days wouldn't even be an option. By the way, do you even know what kind of food Oliver is currently eating? 
James and I have been taking care of him. I thought you loved Oliver, but now you only pet him when you feel like it and ignore him otherwise. It's so contradictory that it's almost funny. When I said what I was honestly thinking, Kelly blushed with anger. Why do I have to be told that by you? You're a stranger, the one who took away my dad, so it's all your fault. Hey, that's enough, James stepped in. Kelly, who couldn't understand what I was saying, snapped even more. You've been spouting nothing but self-centered nonsense. How is it all Olivia's fault? I really can't understand what you're thinking, James said. Daddy, Kelly cried, clinging to James. But James coldly looked down at her. Just leave this house. What? Why all of a sudden? Kelly asked, shocked. I can't keep someone in this house who, on a whim, endangers another's life and then forgets all about it and merrily goes about playing. Get out now. But. Enough. You think you have the right to talk back. You really don't think of anyone but yourself. Kelly tried to persuade James, but he brushed her off. Desperate, she turned to me. Olivia, please say something. No, it's no use. Just leave, as James said. Stop clinging to me. Just as he said, you really only think about yourself. Hearing my words, Kelly hung her head with a resigned look. She dragged her suitcase and left the house. Her figure seemed lonely, but oddly enough, I didn't feel sorry for her at all. After Kelly left, the house was eerily quiet. The tension that had been building up for years finally seemed to dissipate, but it left an uncomfortable silence. James sat down heavily on the sofa, his face a mixture of anger, sadness, and exhaustion. I'm sorry, Olivia. I should have seen what was happening. I should have done something sooner, James said, breaking the silence. It's not your fault, James. Kelly hid her actions well, and I didn't speak up. We both share some of the blame, I replied, sitting next to him. But still, I should have been more aware. As her father, I should have known, he sighed, rubbing his temples. We can't change the past. We just have to move forward and hope Kelly learns from this, I said, trying to offer some comfort. James nodded, though he still looked troubled. I'll reach out to her in a few days, once things have calmed down. Maybe some time apart will give her perspective. I agreed, hoping that this separation might indeed help Kelly reflect on her actions and understand the consequences of her behavior. For now though, we had to focus on rebuilding our lives without the constant tension. The following days were a mix of relief and sadness. The house felt lighter without Kelly's presence, but there was also an emptiness. I kept myself busy with household chores and taking care of Oliver, who seemed to sense the change and stayed close to me. James took a few more days off work to be with me. We spent time talking about the future, making plans to strengthen our relationship, and discussing how to handle things if Kelly decided to come back. One evening, as we sat on the porch watching the sunset, James turned to me and said, Thank you for staying strong through all of this, Olivia. I know it hasn't been easy. It hasn't been easy for you either, James. But we're in this together, and we'll get through it, I replied, squeezing his hand. We sat in comfortable silence, finding solace in each other's presence. Despite the turmoil of the past few days, I felt hopeful for the first time in a long while. Two weeks later, James received a call from Kelly. She sounded calmer, though there was still a hint of defiance in her voice. They talked for a long time, and James assured her that he still loved her, but made it clear that her actions had serious consequences. Kelly agreed to seek counseling and apologized for her behavior. It was a small step, but a significant one. We all knew it would take time to rebuild trust, but this was a start. Life gradually returned to a new normal. James and I focused on strengthening our marriage and creating a supportive environment at home. Kelly stayed away for a while, giving herself the space to grow and reflect. As the months passed, the wounds began to heal. Kelly visited occasionally, and while there were still challenges, the atmosphere was less charged. We were cautiously optimistic, hoping that with time, 
we could all find a way to coexist peacefully and perhaps even become closer as a family. I received a lot of emails and calls from Kelly. She sent me messages like, I'm sorry, and please forgive me. Looking at the volume and timing of those emails, and calls sending a bunch all at once or at random times, regardless of day or night, it really showed her self-centered side. She also sent updates about where she's been living and how she's been getting by. Apparently, she's been living in cheap motels while working. I thought she could just stay at a hotel or rent an apartment, but she seems picky about having separate bathrooms, wanting a clean place, and so on. She's having a hard time settling on a place, and even if she finds a good one, the rent is too high for her. She sent the same messages to James, who was stunned. He said, it's either she really can't manage on her own, or she's just too selfish. But honestly, no matter the situation, I'd never let Kelly back into this house. I really wish she'd take a moment on her own to reflect on her actions. After Kelly left, our lives returned to peace. James still travels for work, but not as much as before, so we have more time to relax together. It's nice not having to be so careful around each other and to just relax. Kelly never listened no matter how many times we warned her, so in a way, I'm glad things turned out this way. Every day spent with James is pure joy. After finishing the housework and relaxing on the sofa, Oliver climbed onto my belly. He meowed and curled up to sleep. I hope for many more moments like this. As I petted Oliver, I found myself lost in these thoughts. The flood of messages from Kelly was overwhelming. Every day, she'd send me multiple emails, each one a mix of apologies and updates. I'm really sorry, please forgive me, one message read. Another detailed her struggles, explaining how she was living in a cheap motel because she couldn't find a place that met her standards within her budget. She complained about dirty bathrooms and high rents, showing her usual picky nature. It was clear she was having a tough time, but her self-centered approach made it hard to sympathize fully. She didn't seem to grasp the seriousness of what she had done or show any real understanding of the hurt she caused. The same pattern of messages went to James, who was equally stunned. He remarked, it's either she really can't manage on her own or she's just too selfish. Despite her situation, I knew I couldn't let Kelly back into our home. She needed time to reflect on her actions and understand the consequences. Bringing her back would only mean more chaos and tension, and I wasn't willing to go through that again. I hoped that this time apart would help her grow and change for the better. With Kelly gone, our home became a place of peace and relaxation. James's work trips became less frequent, giving us more time together. We no longer had to tiptoe around Kelly's moods and behavior. The quiet moments we shared were filled with comfort and joy. Whether we were having dinner, watching TV, or simply sitting in silence, there was a sense of harmony that had been missing for so long. One evening, after finishing my chores, I settled on the sofa with Oliver. The little cat, sensing my calm, jumped onto my belly, meowed softly, and curled up to sleep. I stroked his fur, feeling his gentle purring. It was in these simple moments that I found the greatest happiness. As I sat there, my mind wandered to the future. I imagined more days like this, filled with peace and contentment. I thought about how James and I could continue to strengthen our bond, making up for the lost time we spent dealing with Kelly's issues. I also hoped that Kelly, wherever she was, would find her way and learn to take responsibility for her actions. Despite the challenges we faced, I felt hopeful. Life had a way of throwing unexpected hurdles, but we had navigated through them and come out stronger. The future seemed bright, and I was ready to embrace it with open arms. Oliver stirred slightly, adjusting his position before settling back down. His warmth and softness were comforting reminders of the love and stability I now had. As I continued to pet him, I felt a sense of gratitude for these peaceful days and the strength to face whatever came next. The days turned into weeks and our lives continued to improve. 
James's presence at home made a significant difference. We spent our weekends exploring new hobbies, going for long walks, and even planning a few short trips. It felt like a second honeymoon, a chance to reconnect and rebuild our lives together. Every so often, James would check in with Kelly, encouraging her to seek counseling and offering support from a distance. It was clear he still cared for her deeply, but he also understood the need for her to learn and grow on her own. Our conversations about Kelly were more hopeful than before, focusing on her potential for change rather than the mistakes of the past. In the quiet moments, I often reflected on how far we had come. The journey had been tough, but it had also brought James and me closer. We had learned to communicate better, to support each other more fully, and to cherish the peaceful moments we now enjoyed. Oliver remained a constant source of comfort and joy. His playful antics and affectionate nature were daily reminders of the simple pleasures in life. Whether he was chasing a toy or curling up next to us, he added a touch of warmth and love to our home. As the seasons changed, so did our outlook on life. We were no longer weighed down by the past, but were instead looking forward to a future filled with possibility. Each day was a new opportunity to build on the peace we had found and to create a life that was truly our own. In the end, it wasn't just about surviving the storm, but about finding the strength to thrive in its aftermath. With James by my side and the love we shared, I knew we could face anything that came our way. The future was bright, and I was ready to embrace it with all my heart. You thought you could marry my son? Your standards don't match ours. Don't you dare dream of joining us. Anyway, the point is you're not the right person for my son. Now, leave. That's how coldly my father-in-law spoke to me. My mother-in-law joined in, saying, You only approach Jake for money anyway. My name is Jessica. I'm 35 years old and I work for a company. Since graduating from university, I've been at the same job for years. Some of my coworkers left to start their own businesses, get married, or have children. But I stayed and devoted myself to my work every day. You might think I'm a lonely workaholic, but I'm not because I have a boyfriend named Jake. Jake was a business partner. I thought he was a nice young man who took his work seriously. As we worked together, we started to like each other. He confessed his feelings for me, and we started dating. It's been a few years since we started dating, and now we're even engaged. But if you ask me if I'm not worried about marrying him, I have to admit that I am. He's younger than me, and I wonder if he's okay with our age difference, even though he says it doesn't matter. By the way, his father is a business owner, and Jake works for his father's company. This means that one day, Jake will take over the company and become its president. I was worried that his parents would oppose our marriage. I'd been feeling uneasy about it for a long time. Of course, I was happy when he asked me to marry him, but I wondered if we could really get married. However, Jake didn't seem to mind at all. His optimism was one of the things I loved about him. He had already met my parents, and we often had nice dinners together. My parents agreed that we should get married, and they liked Jake very much. Finally, the day came to meet Jake's parents. I had been so nervous about it for weeks. Their house was spectacular, just as I expected for the president of a company. It was so big that it felt like a royal palace. As soon as we arrived, I started to worry if my clothes were appropriate for the occasion. I had picked out nice clothes, but I wasn't sure if they were good enough. I'm from a normal family, so Jake's world felt very different from mine. Jake would take me to fancy restaurants and book expensive hotels for our vacations. He thought that sort of thing was normal, but it made me feel like he lived in a different world. Even so, he never pushed his values on me or bragged about being rich. I don't judge people by their money. I fell in love with you because of your personality and inner beauty, he would say. At first, I wondered why he was dating an older and ordinary woman like me. But his sweet words made me believe he truly loved me for who I am. 
because we love each other deeply, Jake and I are getting married. I feel like I've met a wonderful man, and I want his parents to approve of our marriage. Don't worry, babe. I've already told my parents about you, he said to encourage me. Then the front door opened, and his mother welcomed us. Welcome, you must be Jessica. Yes, I'm Jessica. Nice to meet you. His mother gave me a quick nod and let us in. The living room was huge, and Jake's father was there, sitting on a big luxurious sofa, waiting for us. I felt nervous all of a sudden. Meeting his mother made me nervous, but his father was even more intimidating, as you'd expect from the president of a company. It's a pleasure to finally meet you. My name is Jessica. Thank you for inviting me today, I said, my voice shaking. Jake looked at me and smiled. Don't be so nervous. But his parents weren't smiling. They were staring at me with very cold eyes. I felt a chill down my spine. Please sit down, his father said, pointing to the sofa. It felt like a job interview. Well, no, excuse me, his father said as soon as I sat down. His mother agreed with him. Hey, mom, dad, what are you doing? What do you mean, no? It's rude to say such a thing, Jake said, upset, trying to defend me. But his parents didn't seem to listen. How old are you anyway? You look pretty old to me, his father asked. I'm 35, I replied. You're five years older than Jake. How can we accept Jake marrying an older woman like you? His mother said. Besides, it's already too late for you to have children, isn't it? We need someone who can give us grandchildren. I think it has to be a young woman, at least younger than Jake. I knew they would mention my age. And you're single at your age? I can't help but think you have some kind of problem. Maybe you're too difficult or have a bad personality or something like that, his mother added. Mom, what are you talking about? Jessica is a wonderful person with a great personality, Jake protested. Then why hasn't she married before? His mother shot back. Excuse me, I said. I know I'm a little older to be married, but I love my job and wanted to work hard. I've always prioritized my work over marriage. That's why I didn't get married until now. It wasn't until I met Jake that I realized I wanted to get married. I was almost overwhelmed by the pressure from his parents. I tried my best to choose my words carefully, but their attitude didn't change at all. Working harder? It's not like the company you work for is a big one. Even if you work hard and get promoted, you don't get paid much, do you? I think you should focus more on making yourself more attractive as a woman. You know, it would be nice if you put in some effort. Yes, even at your age, you can still look better. Maybe some plastic surgery would help, his father said. Honey, that's too straightforward, his mother added. I saw his parents laugh for the first time, but it was only when they were making fun of us. I was so shocked and angry that I didn't know what to say. You thought you could marry my son? Your standards don't match ours. Don't you dare dream of joining us. Anyway, the point is you're not the right person for my son. Now leave, his father said coldly. My mother-in-law joined in. You would have approached Jake for money anyway. I don't know how you fooled my son but you can't fool us too. That's enough. You guys can say whatever you want, but it's my life. I'll decide who I marry, Jake tried to defend me. I stopped him and said, I see. I understand how you feel, but it's quite rude of you to say such horrible things to me, especially since we just met. I don't care if you're richer or not. It's not important to me. But if I were to become rich, I definitely wouldn't want to be like you. I stood up and walked out. We don't need to have any more conversations. As I left their house, his father shouted, You've got to be kidding me. Don't you dare insult us, you beggar. We'll never allow you to marry my son. I don't want to be related to people like you anyway, I said. You're such a disgraceful person. I'd like to see the faces of the parents who raised a woman like you, his father fought back. I ignored him and left their house. Their attitude was just too much for me to handle. I walked outside, frustrated. Then Jake came running after me, looking worried. Jessica, I'm sorry. I never thought my parents would say something like that. 
It was horrible, but maybe it's a good thing we found out now. It would have been a lot more pressure if we got married in that situation. Anyway, I'm leaving them. I'm not taking over dad's company. I'm quitting too. You shouldn't make such a decision in a rush, I said. I'm not rushing. I really do love you, Jessica. We didn't get together for money, so there should be no problem if I leave the house. Well, that's true, but... Let's go to your parents' house and tell them about this, he said, pulling my hand and starting to walk. My parents were surprised by our sudden visit, but they welcomed us warmly. While having tea, we told my parents what had happened. My father listened without saying a word. Jake, your father's company is called SpaceX, right? And your father's name is Henry Cavill. Yes, but why? That's what I thought. I see. Why don't we go with you to your parents' house now? Dad, what's going on? Because they said they wanted to see her face, right? Let's go show her face then, shall we? My father isn't the type to get provoked, so I was surprised by his reaction, but he was ready to go. So we had no choice but to go back to Jake's parents' house. This time, Jake's father answered the door, not his mother. You again, I won't forgive you, no matter how many times you come back. Whose daughter do you think you were talking to, Patrick? My father said. Jake's father looked at my father, rolling his eyes. It took him a few seconds to finally recognize something. Mr. Richard, is that you? You finally remembered. Your daughter means her father is me. That's right. She's my only daughter. We had her later in our marriage. By the way, how dare you insult my precious daughter? Have you forgotten what I told you back then for two years? No, you see, when you were arrested for smoking and drinking, you were even caught shoplifting. I covered for you and gave you a chance to become a better person, didn't I? I did everything I could so you could get a decent job. Didn't I teach you that no one can live alone, and we all need to support each other? And yet, as soon as your company became successful, you forgot all that, didn't you? I, I apologize for that, Jake's father said, now looking fragile, a complete change from before. If you want to be the president of a company, you need to treat people with compassion. Do you think you're better than others just because you're successful? Aren't you looking down on people when you shouldn't? Well, that's, he seemed to understand what was being said. Dad, my boss always says his stomach hurts from stress. Are you harassing him? Jake asked. What are you talking about? I'm just pushing him hard because I expect better of him, his father said, starting to come unraveled. Just when I thought you'd finally come to your senses, you're back to your old self. You're a real pain, Patrick. First of all, I want you to apologize to my daughter for insulting her. Yes, I am sorry, Jessica, he said, bowing his head to me, prompted by my father. It seemed that the master-slave relationship from their student days was still hard to change. Honey, you should apologize to her as well, my father-in-law said to his wife. My mother-in-law bowed her head as well. I felt relieved that his parents apologized to me. Hey, I'm leaving this house in the company too, Jake said. His parents panicked. Wait a minute, if you leave, who's going to take over? Your father's right. You're the only one we have left. I'm sick of you controlling everything in my life, Jake replied. I covered for you and gave you your chance to become a better person, didn't I? My father said, his voice steady and strong. I did everything I could so that you could get a decent job. Didn't I teach you that no one can live alone, and we all support each other? And yet, as soon as your company is successful, you forgot all that, haven't you? Jake's father seemed taken aback, his previous arrogance gone. I, I apologize for that, he said, his voice trembling. The man who had been so intimidating just moments before now seemed fragile, a complete change from before. If you want to be the president of a company, you need to treat people with compassion, my father continued. Do you think you're better than others just because you're successful? Aren't you looking down on people when you shouldn't? Jake's father hesitated. Well, that's... Apparently, he had an idea of what was being said. He knew my father was right, 
but pride kept him from admitting it fully. Dad, Jake spoke up, his voice filled with frustration. My boss always says his stomach hurts from stress. Are you harassing him? What are you talking about? I'm just pushing him hard because I expect better of him, Jake's father said, but his confidence was waning. He was starting to come unraveled under the pressure. My father looked at him with disappointment. Just when I thought you'd finally come to your senses, you're back to your old self. You're a real pain, Patrick. First of all, I want you to apologize to my daughter for insulting her. Jake's father looked at me, his face a mixture of shame and regret. Yes, I am sorry, Jessica, he said, bowing his head to me, compelled by my father's firm stance. It was clear that the power dynamics from their past were still deeply ingrained. Honey, you should apologize to her as well, Jake's father said to his wife, who nodded and bowed her head too. I felt a wave of relief wash over me as his parents apologized. It was a small victory, but it meant a lot. Hey, I'm leaving this house and the company too, Jake announced, his voice steady and resolute. His parents' eyes widened in panic. Wait a minute, if you leave, who's going to take over? His mother asked, her voice trembling. Your father's right, his mother added, desperation creeping into her voice. You're the only one we have left. Jake shook his head, his resolve unshaken. I'm sick of you controlling everything in my life. I've made my decision. My father stepped forward, his presence commanding the room. Patrick, it's time you learned that respect and kindness are more important than wealth and status. You've been given a chance to change. Don't waste it. With that, we left the house. Jake and I walked away together, leaving behind the toxic environment that had tried to tear us apart. It was the beginning of a new chapter for us, one where we could build a future based on love, respect, and mutual support. I am going to start my own company and see how far I can go on my own, Jake declared. And I'll marry Jessica as I promised. Thanks for everything. Jake bowed his head deeply to say goodbye to his parents. Their faces turned completely pale and they froze in shock. Despite their reaction, we left them behind and walked away together. My father had been a high school teacher until he retired and I had no idea that Jake's father was one of his former students. When I looked up the company Jake worked for on their website, I saw Patrick's picture. My father had told me that he had a student who became successful, but he never mentioned who it was. At first, my father was happy to see that one of his students had achieved something great. He always believed in hard work and integrity. You can't be blinded by money and forget what's important, he used to say. My father was a dedicated teacher, always strict about values like honesty and humility. Jake followed through on his promise. He quit his job and started his own business. I supported him while continuing to work at my own job. Jake had a natural talent for being a business owner, and his company started making a profit early on. I was proud of him and happy to see his success. We got married, just as we had planned, and became husband and wife. We live joyfully every day, supporting and loving each other. Our life together is filled with happiness and mutual respect. As for my father-in-law, his story took a different turn. Some of his employees sued him for harassment, which caused the company's stock price to drop significantly. As a result, he was dismissed from his position as president. It was a harsh reminder that no matter how successful you are, treating people with respect and kindness is essential. Seeing how things turned out for Jake's father made me even more grateful for my own father. My father taught me the importance of humility and compassion. He was a role model who lived with integrity and dignity, and I strive to live my life by those same principles. Now, Jake and I focus on building a life together, filled with love and mutual support. We work hard, enjoy our time together, and always remember the values that truly matter. Please subscribe to our channel if you like our story. We'll see you in the next video.